and get ready to be challenged on what you think you know about history. Human beings have been around for more than 200,000 years, but for most of that time, we have next to no idea what was happening. What was life like back then? Now, in the hell year that is 2021, this question may not seem relevant to your life. You're focused on the question of, how can I meet Timothy Chalamet? But trust me, the story of our distant past matters greatly right now. Because our societies are built on certain assumptions about human nature and what we were like before agriculture, before industrialization. In the 1600s, Thomas Hobbes argued that people are naturally competitive and thus that they need kings because only hierarchy can keep humans from falling into brutality and chaos. Others, like the philosopher Rousseau, argued that early humans were peaceful, almost utopian, hunter-gatherers before private property and social hierarchies ruined it all. But what if our early picture of human societies and thus our assumptions about how we might live today are all wrong? What if early humans actually had a rich history of social experimentation? That's the question that the archaeologist David Wengro and the late anthropologist David Graeber set out to answer a decade ago. The result of that labor is The Dawn of Everything, a nearly 700-page masterwork arguing that the prevailing big picture of human history is wrong. Graeber, who died suddenly last year, and Wengro say we treat modern, we modern folks treat prehistoric humans the way we treat indigenous communities, giving short shrift to them and their cultures and ideas in ways that make our own culture seem superior, like the inevitable high point of all human progress. But there's lots of evidence to suggest that our ancient predecessors lived in remarkable and interesting ways that have much to teach us. From a huge city-like settlement in Louisiana almost 4,000 years ago, before agriculture took off, to warrior aristocrats in Turkey a thousand years before that. Add it all up, the authors say, and you have a picture of early humans who imagined and built societies far more interesting than we've assumed until now. Anarchism, radical equality, authoritarianism, even small c communism. You can see hints of all of these ways of organizing people in this expanded historical record. This matters now because there are so many aspects of modern life that we treat as natural and inevitable, like climate change. Okay, it sucks, but pollution is the cost of civilization for eight billion people, right? Can't be avoided. Well, David Vengro says, that's a myth posing as a fact. And when you free yourself from the myths we all take for granted, it's just as easy to imagine a world where human civilization prioritizes ecology or equality in radically novel ways. That's not such a surprising conclusion if you know anything about co-author David Graeber, who fused scholarship with activism and is best known as one of Occupy Wall Street's leaders. He's credited with coining Occupy's slogan, we are the 99%. Sadly, Graeber died last year at the age of 59, just weeks after he and David Wengro completed a draft of The Dawn of Everything. But Graeber's work lives on in this book, and in its tantalizing promise that other worlds are possible for us. What might these worlds look like? Who better to ask than one of the book's authors? David Wengro is a professor of comparative archeology span at University College London, and he joins me now for his first televised interview about this important new book he co-authored with David Graeber, The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity. Uh, David, thank you so much for staying up late in Britain and joining us. This is heady, challenging stuff. How does a 700-page book that goes really, really deep on ancient farming methods to make a fine point about political societies end up as one of the most pre-ordered books on Amazon? Well, I think you, uh, you need to ask the readers, uh, not me, that particular question. But we, we didn't actually intend to write such a vast tome. Uh, our initial intention was actually to write a small kind of uh, position paper or a pamphlet, um, really just trying to bring readers up to speed on, on many of these uh, extraordinary discoveries that have been flooding in from our fields of archaeology and anthropology over the last 20, 30, 40 uh, odd years. Um, but then we realized that actually a lot of the work of synthesis to bring together uh, all of this new information wasn't necessarily happening in our own field. So we sort of felt we had to start doing it ourselves. And the project grew uh, kind of incrementally from there. 
into something that really isn't a pamphlet, as you say. It's, it's a bit of a doorstopper with a, something like a 70-page uh, bibliography. I want to make this very uh, real for people. Um, you are suggesting that there are real examples of prehistoric societies, structures, ways of living that should make us think anew about how we might live. Can you give me a couple of examples of ways of living that we didn't know about until recently that you highlight that should make all of us think about how we live now? Well, for example, your last guest actually, I thought, um, gave a very articulate uh, explanation of how the current climate crisis is really rooted in, in forms of inequality. And uh, lying behind that, I think, are some very deep assumptions about the development of human societies in general. For example, the notion that as soon as we invented agriculture, out of that came private property, and then societies scale up to the level of cities. And somehow, in that process, it becomes inevitable that we form hierarchies and that we do have these radically in the unequal uh, forms of social arrangements. Actually, it turns out that the latest scientific evidence from various parts of the world shows that this simply isn't true. So just to give you uh, one of our favorite examples in the book, uh, discoveries coming out of Eastern Europe uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, north of the Black Sea, not one of the areas that we traditionally associate with the origins of cities, but there are settlements there which go back about 6,000 years, so they're as old as the earliest known cities in uh, the Middle East, in Iraq and Syria, what we call ancient Mesopotamia. They're as ancient as those, they're as large as those, they had enormous populations in the tens of thousands, but they don't exhibit any of these signs of hierarchy or inequality. There are no temples or palaces, there are no rich burials. Um, in fact, uh, careful analysis by archaeologists suggests that these vast settlements uh, actually regulated themselves and ordered themselves largely from the bottom up through things like neighborhood councils and assemblies. We have other cases of ancient cities which began on a course towards hierarchy, king stratification, and then changed course. Uh, a great example of this is from the Valley of Mexico, uh, the city that we know today as Teotihuacan, around the year zero. Uh, people start flooding in their thousands uh, to form a settlement there. They build the great monuments that you can see today. If you go as a tourist to Teotihuacan, you see the, the pyramids of the sun and the moon, the temple of the, uh, the feathered serpent. But then after about two or three centuries, they stop and the whole thing changes course. And actually they uh, plow all of their resources and efforts into something else. And that something else is an extraordinary project of social housing. So by about uh, AD 300, uh, we have something in the order of 100,000 people, uh, with the vast majority of them living in what to us look like luxury villas, really extraordinary, lovely apartment compounds a million miles away from our idea of social housing with people crammed into high rises. Um, so this is a society that actually uh, changed course. And it's important to emphasize this point about scale because our conventional view of human history, uh, which you can find in most of these sort of big history books out there that try and take on the, the broad sweep of, of the human past, they give us the message that small, Basically, small means egalitarian and simple. Big means complex, but also hierarchical. And as your previous guest uh, pointed out, you know, with approaching sort of 8 billion people on, on the planet Earth, you're kind of left to draw the obvious conclusion. And it's a fairly dismal one. You know, we can tinker around the edges. We can set targets for carbon emissions and fiddle with tax regimes. But the big story of human history that, that we generally get tells us that we have been for thousands of years on a kind of one-way street to the cultural system that we're currently in, and there's no getting off. Actually, uh, this uh, familiar version of the human story really doesn't stand up to modern scientific investigation. So in the book, what we try to do is bring a lot of that information out of the ivory tower of specialist journals and academic conferences and piece together uh, the puzzle. 
to give a sense of this new emerging picture of human possibilities. Because, you know, again, just going back to your previous interview, which I caught the end of, this is it. This is the point at history that, that we're in. We have the, the climate summit going on uh, right now, where really what is being put to the test is our capacity as a species to transform ourselves, to move and, and, away. Uh, David, if I may, I want to ask you precisely yeah. about that. You wrote uh, an essay in The Guardian this week that got a lot of attention that specifically said that the relationship, the kind of toxic relationship we have to the Earth right now isn't the only way one can relate to the Earth. And some of what you've uh, uncovered from the distant past sheds light on different ways of relating to the Earth. What are some of the ideas about how people, ancient people, related to the Earth that deserve uh, to be recovered? Well, it's not just ancient people. There are people still alive today, the, the descendants of what we call indigenous societies or First Nations, who are really way ahead of us and have been way ahead of us for many, many centuries on precisely these kinds of issues. But I think we've convinced ourselves, when I say these kinds of issues, I mean things like forms of land management, which are not based uh, purely on the ethos of ownership and extraction and sort of unlimited growth. So, for example, in many Aboriginal and Indigenous uh, systems of land management, the whole concept of ownership is based on something else. Uh, it's actually based on a notion of care. Um, or caretaking. So there's something rather peculiar about our own uh, European uh, legal systems as they relate to property. Actually, it's rooted in ancient legal systems going all the way back to ancient Rome, where the ultimate form of ownership is what in Latin, I think, is referred to by the term abusus, abusus, which is exactly what it sounds like, you know, to ultimately own something is to have the right to commodify it, buy it, sell it, or even, you know, throw it away, destroy it. Um, this is a historically unusual notion of property. Uh, actually, in many uh, First Nations societies in the Americas, uh, in Australia, for example, to own something, including a, a territory or a species or the right to hunt a species or, or uh, take resources from uh, nature, um, is actually quite the opposite. It's, it's based on the idea that you look after them and you, you cultivate a landscape in order that they can flourish. And the point that I would emphasize and what history and archaeology show us is that systems of the other kind, the kind I've been describing, did not only work on a small scale. You know, we have a tendency to romanticize indigenous peoples, but we forget that their demographic smallness of numbers is itself a direct outcome of our own dominant cultural system and the genocides and pandemics and other things that it's inflicted on uh, on people, not just in the global south, uh, but but all over the world. Your, your co-author, the late David Graeber, died before seeing this book go to press. Uh, he's been called a genius, a towering intellect, an outspoken activist, uh, mentor to so many people. Uh, he was even called too liberal for Yale University when they didn't renew his teaching contract. How does this book reflect him and his legacy? As you achieve this conversation-changing success with this book already, I wonder what your, what your thoughts are for David Graeber. Well, um, this book was enormous fun to write with David because the David I knew was a private person. And, and you know, as, as, as you're aware, it's often very difficult to reconcile um, your private understanding of someone who you're close to with public uh, perceptions of them. But what I can say is that David's uh, scholarly work, his research and his activism, they were all of a piece uh, for him. And actually, it's a very logical process. If you think about it, his involvement with the uh, global justice movement, all of that is really about asking one question, which is along the lines of, is this actually the only way for us to live? Are uh, these kinds of societies the only ones um, in which we can uh, organize ourselves? And um, actually what archaeology and anthropology do is try to look at the full range, the whole of human history, and all of the, the varieties of possible social and cultural systems that have existed. And what really struck us when we started collaborating and working together on this project 
is that when other scholars have tried to do that, to kind of capture the, the broad sweep of human history, more often than not, they end up doing exactly the opposite and giving us this kind of teleological story about how actually entirely inevitable that we would end up exactly the way we are. So there is certainly a logical connection between the scientific aspect of David's work and his wider attitude to, to the world we live in. And I think scientists who don't scrutinize their, uh, their cultural uh, surroundings um, are not really the better for it and tend to just end up repeating uh, the sort of truisms of uh, the culture they were brought up in. David wasn't like that. He was always questioning. At the Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity is the book. It's out November 9th, and you can pre-order it now. David Wengrow, thanks so much for your time. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen, and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.